just making sure. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you, as was just said, about understanding and directing what models learn. So a big starting point with the, the rise of digitization, there is a lot more information at the hands of scholars. Um, but there's a big caveat here. They can still only examine uh, at closely a certain number of documents because time hasn't changed. They haven't magically found more time to do so. It still takes a lot of effort to study any particular artifact. And so this has sort of led to this problem that, one, we have now millions of books or images of artifacts that we could look at and examine, but it's still accessible to some degree because we have to know what we want to look at. And it's hard to make any sort of grand claims of like what the entire collections are doing because we can't study a million things closely. And so that sort of leads to where computational methods might help uh, because machine learning and statistical models can help us organize these large, massive collections into latent vector spaces of lower dimensions so that they're uh, more efficiently analyzable and can maybe help give us insights about our original collections. So what exactly do you mean, I mean about latent vector spaces? Each object is now some k-dimensional vector of numbers, which we can either represent just literally as a list of numbers represented by pretty colors and blue, uh, or we can think of them in more of a visual representation by thinking of these vectors as actual points in a k-dimensional space. But for actual visibility and sort of thinking of, and reasoning about these uh, spaces, we'll often project down to two dimensions because I don't know about you, I can't actually see in 100 dimensions. But two dimensions is a lot easier to think about. And so within these spaces, there are sort of two big properties we hope to gain. One, that the sort of points in the space, the, the closer they are, the more similar they are. So if we have vector representations of uh, a collection of, photo of like photographs, uh, early photographs in this case, that we might find the images on the left, as I'm connected to this. There we go. Uh, if we find images on the left, we might hope to find these similar pictures of the same individual in the sort of same session in this space, which may not be labeled because they are just thousands of these images with, in photography without necessarily much date besides maybe where it was taken. And so that can help us find and explore the spaces and hopefully find objects that a particular scholar is interested in if they already have a starting point. But additionally, it can help us think about these spaces more broadly by thinking how information is encoded within these spaces. And that we might turn, be able to turn the sort of large sort of space that has some seeming clusters, but when we actually color them by some particular feature, we can see that in fact it is sort of representing some trends of the space. But with all of this, there is sort of a big catch. Uh, machine learning and models have largely been trained on a very different set of data than anything that resembles sort of a set of literature or artwork. And so we think about what the Wall Street Journal and Wikipedia has provided. There are some dramatic differences from working with a large collection of novels from HathiTrust. And similarly, Flickr data of sort of the images generated by users throughout time doesn't look very similar to necessarily the very, very uh, sort of specifically crafted images produced of collections from the Met or the Frick collection. And so this is sort of, this gap isn't always, sometimes very easy to map that in fact you don't need to care because sometimes the Wall Street Journal is good enough in terms of language compared to novels, as well as some images are pretty similar. But we do actually have, but it's not always the case. And so that's where sort of my work comes in. So I generally have two big questions. One, what do models actually learn? It sounds very simple, but in some sense, what a task does well downstream doesn't necessarily indicate how it's learning that or what it's actually entailing. So one big way this has come up in previous work is that I've looked at how the geometries of word embedding spaces may not always actually correlate to semantics, that there are other effects. Am I buzzing? All right, okay. Did it go away, everyone? All right, I'm just gonna set this down again. Um, so because of that, uh, there are other pieces affecting the geometries of these spaces, so things that are similar to each other are not necessarily just derived by meaning, which might not be surprising, but is worth noting depending on how we're using these systems. Additionally, we can think about how extractive features might actually be usable from a more humanistic inquiry uh, expectation. Can we use these extracted features based on Flickr data and asking questions about deriving, like identifying dogs and dishwashers to try to understand the avant-garde movement of Dada? It seems a bit crazy, and in some sense it is, but there still are these questions of how do you make these efforts to sort of transition to these other problem cases that are still of a visual nature.
and, or maybe not visual, depending on how you think uh, the data movement sort of itself is represented. Uh, but there are these sort of questions and sort of carrying that space in, as well as thinking about how humanities collections often sort of, because of their diverse nature, can hit sort of breaking assumptions about what models actually require. And so in the case of Middle English, standardized spelling is, not is far from guaranteed and not the norm. And so because of that, you have a lot of issues with text analysis. Because if you can't assume a word is spelled one way consistently across authors or scribes or sources, there are additional problems for what you can actually learn. And so there's a lot of an ongoing effort I'm working with medievalists about trying to understand what we can actually actually gain from computational methods, given that these things are now being largely digitized, but there's still a large sort of fallout from what we can actually do. And so the other second big question is, OK, we may learn what these models have learned. Or we may know what they've learned to some degree. Um, but how can we actually direct that learning to be something that's more productive and useful for any particular line of reasoning? So for instance, with topic modeling, how can we take topic models that are maybe reflecting some structure that's known from previous studies of all these individual objects and learn something that's new and maybe cross-cutting uh, across these spaces. So instead of learning about authors, we might be able to learn about themes across writers. Uh, similarly, in ongoing work, I'm sort of thinking about how uh, we can direct uh, the understanding of linguistic features represented in distributional semantics like word embeddings. How can we use, how can we direct what they learn in some sense more not necessarily direct, but understand what they learn, what they learn, and how we can use that to better understand language. And then finally, a sort of last crazy task of understanding the great many mediums that we have for, under, for how can we direct image features to be more useful and productive for art historic angles, including when there are many different sort of forms and mediums that the same object and iconography can take place in, whether it be a cast of an object, a drafting drawing of an object, or the actual sort of colored picture itself. And so with that, oh, and OK, sorry. Uh, the last part is that I'm going to actually be focusing mostly on this problem about understanding uh, how to make topic models more useful and learning more interesting things. And I'll very briefly touch on the sort of ongoing work on linguistic features. And so with that, I'm going to now be, so I'm going to, with my advisor, uh, I worked on uh, biasing models away from things we already know. Uh, so, but actually, what I'm actually, I'm going to be talking about is sort of the goal of analyzing speculative fiction, in particular, the genres of horror, fantasy, and science fiction. And so we can imagine if we, with enough computational effort, we might like to map out the space of speculative fiction as a genre. Maybe there is an area that is like clearly science fiction, maybe hard science fiction for sort of shifting towards more fantasy, maybe horrors in some other corner. But we're and like maybe, you know, where the heck does new weird go or anything that's sort of Lovecraftian? You might have these sort of questions, and honestly, scholars want to learn about this and sort of think about this, especially at scale. How might this sort of mapping change over time? What other effects are coming into play? Are there gatekeeping? Is there gatekeeping according to sort of an author's demographics or other sort of factors for what's being allowed to count as science fiction at any particular time? And so we might think that we could use an algorithm such as topic modeling to help us gain insights about genre. Unfortunately, the big sort of takeaway is that if we give, other topics will still be good. But sometimes it's not actually quite as easy as that. Um, if we look at this topic, there are some names in here, but we also have some words that seem promising, like robot, robots, human, brain, law. Maybe it has something to do with artificial intelligence and robotics in science fiction. Unfortunately, we would be wrong because it's just uh, Isaac Asimov's robot series, uh, which and it actually has nothing to do with robots that anyone else, anyone else who, any other writer that's sort of talking about ro robots, their discourses aren't in here. Um, similarly, we might have a topic that looks fairly nonsensical and that doesn't seem to have much semantic meaning, but it doesn't have any names in it, so you know, maybe it's better. Uh, that has Old Night, Yes, Cried Town. Uh, it turns out this is just the Ray Bradbury topic. Uh, it's kind of weird, but it seems to have something to do with Ray Bradbury is highly represented. I mean, he's a prolific writer in science fiction and in this collection. And enough of his works, I guess, involve these kind of discourses that he managed to sort of develop this topic that isn't necessarily explicitly like name-driven, but is sort of his writing form. Uh, and finally, we can end with topics that actually aren't a, a look bad, but actually are good. In this case, we have a topic that's Sand Mars Desert in a series of names. 
We might be worried because of the series of names that caused us problems with the robots topic. Um, but in fact, this one is still actually about Mars. Uh, those character names are characters who are the main character in a Mars-oriented story. And so it becomes quickly clear that we can't just sort of look at these topics and call it a day and just sort of move on. Uh, so with that, um, thinking about what actually makes a good low author correlated topic, it should one be the case that, oh, yeah, okay, it should one be the case that for a topic, the words that are associated with that topic, they should be fairly distributed uh, across the represented authors. As a quick side note for people who know about topic models, topic models are creating probability distributions, not inherently labeling topic level numbers to our text, but we can make this transformation, and I will do it for the remainder of this talk, to think that any collection through the process of being topic modeled, every token in that entire collection will be, have a number that's associated with what topic generated it. So there might be five, there might be 10. This will vary across these tokens. The same word can be in multiple categories. Um, but for any of these given topics as they're represented, we can then think of, well, all of these tokens also have an author that wrote them. And so then we can think instead about these author topic relationships. And so again, with these view, now we can think about how, well, one, if I have a topic, I'd really like it to be the case that uh, it's evenly distributed across the authors that are represented in it, and that it's not just mostly one author and no one else talking. But additionally, there are some grounds here of we don't necessarily need to have every author represented evenly in the collection, because that's a very general topic, and I honestly don't expect every book to talk about, like not every book in speculative fiction talks about space travel. And that's perfectly fine, but hopefully we can find these themes and that they are cross-cutting across these authors. And so to secondly, um, as I've sort of alluded to earlier, that the discourse, and so the probability distribution, if I remove the author, the most prominent author, I should still have a pretty similar distribution. That in fact, the word use, the sort of discourse is not inherently dependent solely on that major author. And finally, I would just sort of want to have this discourse to be general across authors. The reason why these last two are different from the first one is the first one, just sort of think about it, I just want even distributions that were tokens. I'm not describing the sort of case that I want the words that these authors are using to also be similar. And so we can quantify these nicely um, into sort of the first one referring to more of the entropy. And so thinking just about how, again, evenly distributed, distributed are these tokens with their author. Um, and so just for the math that I won't be going into too much here, but just sort of we were looking at the probability of an author given a topic, and we want to know what that probability is for every word in that sort of space. And we're now checking is what's the entropy look like. We want to have high entropy. Low entropy means we have very few authors being represented. It might mean there could be lots of authors technically in there, but it, it's dramatically dominated and predictable about who wrote what tokens. Um, secondly, we'll sort of look at this. What happens if we remove the major author? How comparable are these two distributions? And finally, sort of the, if we rebalance all authors' sort of contributions to be similar, do we again have a similar looking distribution? And so if we go back to the, the forms we were looking at before, we nicely see, we unsurprisingly see that all of these different measurements hold for our two obvious cases. That in fact, the academic topic is nicely, it has, it's distributed across many authors, there's no one particular author that's affecting it, and all of the, talk, all of the authors represented are using similar words. And similarly, this other topic, it's basically like 90 plus percent uh, and McCaffrey, and so surprise, unsurprisingly, none of this holds. Um, but these measurements don't always agree. Um, in this first case, uh, note that bolded words here indicate words that are just specific to a particular author. Um, we have in the first case, it meets the entropy requirement, but if we look at what those words are, it's just literally a list of names that don't necessarily have much to do with each other. And in fact, they're a list of names from many different authors. And so we immediately, or well, through some different authors. And so we have this sort of case that we find that the minus major and balanced metrics both hint that something that, like, these are not reasonable discourses that are happening here. And one that if we remove the major author, the word distribution has shifted dramatically, probably because one of these, a couple of these uh, character names are only auth are very author specific. And secondly, again, if we rebalance this, all of these words, we see just none of these names, like the words that any author is contributing are very different. And if we look at the Mars topic, we, something, we see something interesting. It generally is good. We see that no author, single author, 
is causing a huge problem here. But with the rebalancing, we see that yes, these names are affecting the results. And so it's not necessarily that all of these are indicators that, like any one indicator is an indication that the topic is bad, but it's useful for noting why it still might, might be low quality and why we might question it. And finally, the last topic, uh, it turns out Ray Bradbury is so many of these tokens that if we <laughs> end up, like there are marginal like, you know, tens maybe of token of like words that produced by any other author when we rebalance because they're just so generic, we, we succeed at passing the balancing test even when we failed everything else. And so with these, we can now sort of think about how we might solve the correlation problem. First off, we might go, well, we could add more topics, right? That's often a general like, okay, maybe it's just a case that if we used 100 topics, we just double it. We'll just let the model learn these bad topics and the remaining ones might be good. Unfortunately, all we seem to do is we allow more space for the model to learn more specifically about authors. Um, this picture at least somewhat highlights that of instead of learning, like the purple is a little complicated, but as we get towards 1,000, we just see more and more clear clusters of particular colors, which each represent an author. And if we think about, well, what did it, do our metrics show this? Yes, if we look at the sort of distribution of, of um, our different metrics, where again, for author entropy, we want it to be high. The other two, we actually want them to be low because we're doing a, we're doing a divergence check. Um, we sort of see that none of these distributions look any different, even though I increase the number of topics. So while we're technically increasing in small amounts the number of topics that are good, we're still by and far leaving the majority of our topics to waste. And in fact, they're learning nothing useful. Uh, so, you know, there's a big point here I want to stop at. There's Topic modeling and LDA here is doing nothing wrong. It's in fact working. Uh, it was given data uh, that it was presented with and it found meaningful topics. They're just explicitly not ones that we're interested in finding because we already know who, these book series, we already know these authors. Um, and so they're just not the ones we want. And so we could, uh, so we maybe instead of modify, we could have modify our algorithm, that maybe that would help us if we start uh, learning the sort of ins and outs of authorship and a few of these other attributes. But maybe instead we could modify our data instead of the algorithm. I know this might sound strange, but I want to remind you about something that we all maybe don't love, but we definitely know of sort of pre-processing. So going back to our original passage that I started with from the Wizard of the Earth Sea, we remove a lot of high frequency words to begin with because they cause problems and in the case of topic modeling, end up sort of taking up space. Given that the word the is like 5% generally of any sort of token count population, of, of the overall token usage, it's not helpful and it causes troubles with sort of making, learning these discourses. So we remove all of these words. Again, so you know, it's smaller now. Additionally, we also remove really rare words. So in the case of Gantishman is used once, or using, it occurs less than five total documents. So it's in five pages. It's only in five, we'll just throw it out because again, we can't learn much about it in terms of discourse. Um, so, We've removed a lot here, um, but it's still often, like this is perfectly fine for learning good models in general. Like not necessarily in topic, like not necessarily, not necessarily for our literature case, but this is a common practice for working with news articles uh, and beyond. But so instead I'm gonna suggest, instead of thinking about this as pre-processing, let's think about purposeful data modification. So if we think about how words are correlated with a particular author, um, we might understand that that's part of what's driving these authorial oriented topics. Because not only is topic modeling fighting a case of sort of an assumption that it is, is actually factual, like an assumption that exists called burstiness, that um, if a word occurs once in a document, it's likely to occur again, um, that these models aren't sort of capturing that inherently. Um, but we're also seeing, I mean, if, as soon as you have this effect plus that in a book, for instance, Ron, Hermione, and Harry are likely to co-occur a lot and it has nothing to do necessarily, like it secretly has something to do with friendship and maybe magic, but it actually largely has to do with the fact that you're reading a Harry Potter book and they're commonly in the pages. Uh, so there's sort of the separation that we wanna have for thinking about how do we get the correlation, like these sort of patterns we want and not the sort of more surface level author ones that we have. So let's quickly look at how the word robot correlates across our collection. One, Isaac Asimov, by far and away one of the highest. Here with the robot series, he uses the word robot a lot. Um, on the other end, we can have Jules Verne. Um, he doesn't use the word because it's not coined yet. It just doesn't exist, so he cannot directly use the word robot. 
Um, he could use other words, of course, that are related to robot, but he's not using that word in particular. We also have Philip K. Dick, who, um, again, thinks about androids and robots a fair amount, and so his is higher. And then we can sort of have the rest of the collection and sort of think about how these words vary. Um, sort of note, um, if we think about sort of these usages, there's some that are clearly by far and away far from the norm of how people use the word robot, but there are sort of this middle ground of people, like, it's not just sort of you use it or you don't, there is a lot of, there's sort of a lot of space in between where people are talking about robots, but not necessarily it's quite the scale that everyone else is. Um, so nicely we can sort of fit uh, so with thinking about this a little bit further for our actual problem, let's think about Frank Herbert and Dune. Um, all you need to know for what I'm going to tell you is that there is a character, a main character called Paul Atreides, and he spends a lot of time in the desert. Um, so, one, if we think about how Atreides is, it's a really rare word. It's basically, he's secretly not the, the highest one. That's because that is the book series in the same universe by uh, Kevin J. Anderson and uh, Brian Herbert, um, his son. Uh, or Frank Herbert's son. Um, but so in any case, we see that no one uses this term besides a few people. Um, and again, this would likely drop out with just a simple check of removing words that are infrequent according to authors. No problem here. Um, if we look at the word Paul, we again see these correlations happening, which are likely to make Paul be related with Frank Herbert. Um, but this is a name, so maybe we can just, you know, remove it through NER, uh, because proper names are pretty easy to capture. Uh, but then we have the problem when we get to the desert, um, which is a really common noun, and I want to know about deserts because arid settings are important in speculative fiction, and otherwise just an interesting content point. But again, we have these authors that use these words in such a high volume compared to anyone else. Um, so going back to how might we fix this, that again, this isn't just about proper names or even rare words, um, we could think about making a cutoff list that's sort of specific to a particular author where we just sort of remove the word at any point. But this should draw a lot of, this should raise a lot of red flags because then we'd be removing words like desert from the Dune series and robot from Isaac Asimov's robot series, which clearly seems like a wrong take because we're not learning the most sort of, the most prominent works related to these topics start being removed. Uh, so instead though, we could think about creating a cutoff point um, and just subsampling down uh, all of these really highly over like highly correlated words to something more in line with the rest of the collection. They'll still be sitting at the high end of that, of like they do use the word an extreme amount, but it will be less uh, sort of prominent than before in the hopes that we'll be sort of reducing the sort of immediacy of seeing these high correlated words in terms of authorship and maybe getting towards something more about other discourses like artificial intelligence and automation as opposed to Isaac Asimov's robot series. And so just going back to that working example we had, we started with this. We're going to be removing some words that, again, are extremely context specific. So these are words that pretty much just Ursula K. Le Guin uses. The word storm rack turns out to be not that common. And Ursula, again, is pretty limited to her books. Uh, but we also are going to remove some other words that are sort of related to overusage, which in this case is we remove wizards and mage as well as isle in that not all of these instances, but we're removing some percentage of the sort of emphasis of magic and sort of archipelago island uh, aspects in the Earthsea novels. And so again, we initially had this sort of stark look where a lot of things are clustering by authorship. Um, we do a bit better now. If, if you can kind of see it, there are a lot of actually sort of colors intermixing. Things, some things are still separated, which will happen and isn't so bad. Um, but again, that was a very qualitative view. Let's look a bit more at what actually happens. Um, so if we look back at our methods, um, where none was our original sort of case, we have a lot of things sort of hiding. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of sort of things hiding over there. Um, but as we sort of flip between the no case, where we didn't do anything, um, to the let's just remove words that occur in less than, any word that occurs in less than five, is written by less than five authors, we'll remove them. Um, and the sort of final, let's actually do context probabilistic subsampling. Uh, we sort of see this view that the authorship, the sort of authorial check doesn't really, it does some, it fixes a few problems with some of these checks of like now the major author seems to be lower, probably because now we've lost these sort of really rare names like Atreides that occur very often in text, but very infrequently across authors. Uh, but we haven't sort of solved our larger problem that we still have a lot of these 
heavily author-correlated words, according to entropy or even sort of the balance checks. But that, in fact, by the time we do this sort of context subsampling, we do get a lot better. And another big check you might be wondering of like, well, did we actually move, remove more than words because names? Because if we just were removing names, then maybe all of this was still relatively pointless. Um, but I can at least assure you that, yes, we are removing a lot of things. The way to sort of see this is this was sort of the remove it only if it's used by a few authors. Again, unsurprisingly, this is mostly proper nouns and some common nouns, which I think coined words. <laughs> There's sort of the actual middle column of things we want. And sort of C is the sort of let's just do context-specific list where we dropped everything if, an author, if it was ever highly correlated. And we see that we're doing really well, but we're not removing everything anymore. And that, yes, proper names are often very heavily removed because they are, fairly, are extremely context specific. But in the cases of adjectives and verbs and common nouns, we do, they also matter for these sort of authorial signature marks, not necessarily of their style, but specifically of more of that sort of, con of like these sort of series book level information. Um, there's some other nice results that we do gain with this subsampling. One, that we get to see that topics become more stable. The way to think about what I'm measuring in stability and that I'm not actually giving you a value is if we run a topic model 10 times, how, si like how similar are those 10, like how, many, how similar is sort of the nearest topic distribution in, that other in those other nine models? And so if it's close to one, that means that this topic occurs, this sort of, this one probability distribution of words occurs in every single version of this model. It's often very stable. Um, Often you see this for general words, as we thought, but you also see this extremely true for words that are very low in entropy and are very author specific, um, which was sort of an interesting take and really the things we really want in the end of the day ends up often being this middle ground of things that don't occur very frequently in our original collection, um, but are sort of more salient and sort of sit in between the sort of too general and too specific. Um, and so like, well, you're still gonna have th topics that are infrequent. We do see that the topics we want to stick around and be more permanent uh, are more interesting. And so again, with just sort of back to our running examples, we'll see that one, the academic topic still sits around, is still here. It changes a bit in terms of which words are used as sort of the top words, but the discourse should look familiar and it's sort of reflected in the numbers. That random matched list of names, it's gone because we've removed the sort of notions that these should be matched together. In fact, probably many of these high level words are also gone. Um, we still, unfortunately, have Anne McCaffrey in our collection. Um, it may now look a lot harder to see um, in terms of that these are all common names. They're not, uh, they're not character names anymore, so like Lord Hold between Master Queen. Um, the big note is that these words are being used in a different way in Anne McCaffrey's discourse. Um, hold is not about holding an object. It's about a particular kind of place. Uh, and there's also this problem of why, you might ask, is it still sticking around? It's not just that Anne McCaffrey is prolific, but also that Anne McCaffrey collaborated with other writers who wrote in her same universe. And so because of that, and because of our sort of simple method of just collaborations are unique, we've kept around the sort of artifact that these will still be present, but we can still identify that they're bad, which is useful. Um, and maybe this is help, even helpful for understanding more about these more general discourses for the universe written by different people. And finally, though, our Mars topic is not really about Mars anymore, but instead about arid deserts. This is because not that Mars has been lost, but Mars is hanging out with a sort of planetary space topic. But so we do get these sort of interesting topics. And the bigger and I think honestly more exciting part is that now with these smaller models that are, you know, the model that was only learning 100 topics, it's now able to learn more interesting topics within this small frame that we might not see unless we train over 1,000, uh, which takes a long time. Um, and often produces mostly useless things as you're trying to sift through them. So one, we now learn a topic that's about magic, which we didn't have before, um, and we only get at 1,000 topics, run compared to 100, so at 10 times, you finally get something like it. We get a real machine robots topic. There's also an additional sort of mechanical automation topic to sort of provide this more specificity about what is being discussed with this. So this one's ends up being a bit more about sort of artificial intelligence. The other one's more about building blocks and building machines and sort of the mechanization. Um, and then we finally do are sort of left with these, at one might argue bad, but in other ways I think interesting topics that are name driven, but seem to suggest something more about common names that are specific for particular areas or time periods. In this case, you might think that Charles, Williams, James, Poet, Mary, Henry, Richard, London might be suggestive of England being pretty sort of, 
uh, important here. And that's where, again, I think names can be important for driving these sort of setting cases and other discourses that do rely on proper nouns at times with London. And so we might, again, find something useful. And again, at a much fraction of the cost, because some sampling is pretty easy, we get to run this on uh, just sort of the existing LDA models like Mallet. We can just train it with Mallet. And there we go, we have a really good topic that took a lot less time than trying to run some of these other models or even create, handcraft these very fine detailed lists that may not actually sort of resolve our problem for us. Um, so briefly, I'm going to describe some ongoing work that sort of leads to the general question of, you might ask, I've sort of been toting that purposeful data modification is really useful, but I've only shown it to you for topic models. How might we get beyond that, and how could it possibly be useful for, say, word embeddings? Oh, sorry, uh, before I go on, you had a question? Yeah. So I didn't, in part, consider them for this work because that's extremely, that still is, like, that's really, that's ongoing work that's still very difficult to do. It's hard to seed topics. Well, first off, you have to know what you want to find, um, which is difficult. And then there's sort of the second tier of the seed words you want to use are not often the words that come to mind because they're too general. You need to have words that are very specific to that sort of topical space and not anything else. Um, and so because of that, I was honestly looking for a more sort of generalized tool that one, if I had already run a topic model, could I check what, like, if something's going wrong and have that sort of correlation check? Because while it was fairly obvious in this case and other settings like with medieval manuscripts, you get a series of topics that all look like they could be about Arthurian legends. But if you actually go back, you just find that they're about, there are particular manuscripts that have to be about Arthurian legends. And so they aren't these sort of larger discourses that you were hoping for. Um, that, I'm not sure that a sort of, some of these directed tools might help, but they're harder, again, to sort of run. And I was just trying to see if there really was the sort of an intermediate approach that, again, I think there still is a lot to be said of this model won't help you find the topics you were looking for, which would still make these sort of supervised framing points helpful. Um, but it's also sort of worth thinking about the different kinds of topics that a model can learn as you start sort of affecting what or like what words matter is sort of, I think, a big point. Where we don't do the like large theoretical undergrounding for why these bursty words are specifically going to affect and cause these author-correlated topics. I think there's a lot to be said about that and understanding more about what that means. And even those lists of, like those words that are removed are probably are their own interesting for thinking about series and sort of topic-specific things versus stuff that might be more stylistic, if that helps. All right, and so, a large part of, okay, so we, we know that topic models learn things that we don't necessarily want. Um, as I've sort of alluded to very early on, that word embeddings don't always learn things about language. How might we use word embeddings to gain more understanding still about language and thinking about what they, how the sort of geometric properties of that space um, are encoding this? So let me, let me get there. I know I just sort of unpacked a lot. So I'm not talking about whether something's been learned or not. There are probing tasks, they work really well for saying like, yes, word embeddings learn part of speech information. We also know that because uh, part of speech information, like word embeddings are useful as sort of the incoming, as the input to part of speech taggers and improve tagging quality. Um, but how do these sort of features, are they actually represented within the space? Are we learning um, something sort of fairly, uh, is it very obvious how these sort of information is encoded in a word embedding? Or is it like something that's very higher dimensional and sort of in relationship that we would actually require an LSTM or some other kind of model to sort of actually pull out that information? So to sort of pull back, there was just a very basic question of where are nouns in word embeddings? Um, I honestly didn't know as I was thinking about it, uh, but clearly it kept coming up in sort of thinking about how unsupervised machine translation with alignment occurs um, and sort of thinking about why this is so successful or what that actually means as we're rotating these spaces, what does that look like? Um, so as saying, are we, can we think of nouns as being in one sort of general continent of the space? They're just sort of a giant block of like, you are in noun town, you are here to stay in this part of the, in this sort of, you know, maybe particular piece of the high dimensional space. Maybe it's only a sub, you know, it's 
kind of be a smaller dimensional space neighborhood. So you know, you still have relationships to verbs and some other dimensions. But here, here are nouns, and that's it. Uh, or is it something that we might be more sort of expecting that there are these local islands where related nouns are near each other, but there are other sort of effects going on that nouns are not driving, uh, are not driving the space. Um, in some sense, this is sort of leading to that question of what, does what are we actually expecting to exactly get from distributional semantics? We know that we want to learn, like related words should be near each other and that they should have similar context and occur in similar, like occur near to, uh, occur in similar windows. But syntax also has this effect. We also see this with syntax because I can describe, well, a noun is a noun because it has a determiner before it in English. This is not true of other languages. Uh, but we have some of these other effects. And so thinking about just like, what is, why do we, like how is part of speech learned? Um, how do nouns fit into this picture? What can I do that can affect this? Um, and of course, the bigger part that I cared a lot about as I alluded to translation, does it vary by language? Um, this sort of method assumes that maybe not because if I can just align two embeddings, then either there's sort of some universal attitude about how nouniness or some other sort of, or whatever nouns are sort of being um, seen through, maybe it's some other feature in the sort of island space, but is that sort of really this universal sort of view that we see it? Um, and can we like, and if not, can we understand what that is and sort of understand what is affecting that? Um, so just sort of the initial point here, uh, where am I starting with? I'm starting with, I have, European, I have the European Parliament for seven different languages. I fully believe that these languages are not reflective of linguistic diversity broadly. They are all in Europe, unsurprisingly, and also various like, specific languages and sort of Romance and uh, Germanic forms that are not necessarily difficult in terms of sort of, I mean, difficulty here, I just really mean, and there are differences with English because they are fairly similar in a lot of effects. Um, and again, I'm just going to run spacey. So again, yes, I'm using a different method, but so with, I can get part of speech tags and have some notion of open class words like nouns and, so these, and verbs and sort of these big spaces and are more closed class words, which honestly, besides in sort of authorial style, we don't generally care about them too much because, and sort of other cases where we care about syntax. Uh, because they're very infrequent, they're often very common, and they don't necessarily tell us a whole lot about sort of, in the case of topic models, they don't tell us about topics, they tell us about some other sort of view. Um, in this sort of initial view, I can say yes, that uh, languages do represent part of speech differently. Um, and that you see, you see here that for the glove word of beddings, we have German versus English versus Portuguese, and these don't look they look, you know, partially similar, but they are still fairly different. Um, I have a series of in the works sort of methods for quantifying this difference because um, I, as I, as some of you may know, that TSNI uh, sort of 2D projection algorithm isn't necessarily reliable for believing that these are in fact actual trends, uh, but these do actually hold up as well in sort of the quantitative methods I've come up with. Um, but you know, so I've started with this problem of thinking of like, well, I'm asking questions about language and word embeddings, and honestly, uh, purposeful data modification hasn't really fit into any of this. So you may be wondering like, why are, we st why are you still talking about this data modification part? Um, and I would argue that there's a few things that can come in here. So I've given you this, this sort of static form of like, here is a word embedding. I've trained these word embeddings on this original text, and these are the results I've gotten. But the biggest question is not necessarily that nouns are learned, but how nouns are learned or how they're represented and what's sort of causing or sort of affecting this representation. And so this is where modification can come in terms of I can ask questions about the relationships between nouns and verbs as it's dependent on other words. Are there certain sort of effects of language, like particular word orders or other sort of aspects of either a specific language or languages more generally that are sort of, sort of affecting the syntax? And we can do, and through the sort of data modification effort, we can have this sort of controlled experimental form where we've made these modifications. Maybe I've, and sort of the highlight of what I will give you quickly if it loads, which apparently it doesn't want to. Um, if we remove particular classes of those closed class words I've said before, which in a number of models, like not all, not all NLP, because it isn't all NLP, but a number of NLP models, they're often thrown out or discarded because they're highly frequent. Actually, in other word embedding models, they're largely downsampled so they don't occur almost at all. 
Um, but how do like, these removals of not necessarily a small number of tokens, but a small number of types, affect these spaces of other words that are pretty wild? Um, and so in some sense, this is not very useful. This is not a sort of a strong use case of like, oh, I can see so clearly that it's all about those numbers that matter for um, noun. In fact, that's the exact opposite. Um, oh, this is not quite the one. Um, yeah, so in any case, um, the way to sort of view this is thinking about which, uh, this is sort of that starting point of what matters. Um, do terminers matter? We would expect that they do. Um, and, or some way, how much do they help if that's the only thing you received besides these other sort of open class words? And so we can kind of see that a little bit, although again, with the TCP projections, there's only so much you can sort of infer, that determiners do seem to sort of help maintain the space across the languages. But if we only have numbers, things are looking a lot more dire, and this honestly looks a bit more just like a sort of color palette just thrown together. Um, and except for purple, which I'll just sort of allude to, is proper nouns. It turns out the names could occur no matter what. And even when I just shuffle all the words, words blindly, I haven't deleted anything, but I've just shuffled everything, so order is completely lost. Uh, the sort of proper nouns part still sticks in. In part, this just has to do with these words are co-occurring together, um, and it's sort of not necessarily specific to the syntactic form. and has something to do with European Parliament, as opposed to maybe language more broadly. And so, so to, with that note, I want to sort of take again with the sort of controlled interventions point, that we can think of purposeful mod data modification as sort of a stain on a slide. We don't necessarily replace our uh, microscope every time it doesn't quite show us what we want about our sample. We often instead then try to modify um, the sort of initial sample with a stain so that we can see different effects. So maybe t sometimes we want to see these authorial points and then maybe keeping using topic models. I, I wouldn't necessarily use topic models for authors, but you could at least have these other discourses of if I don't know how to organize these texts, the initial view might be perfectly fine. Maybe I do want to know which books are in the same series or the same universe. But other times I already know that, and maybe I want to have a different stain so I can sort of remove it from view. Um, and so that's where we can sort of think about data modification being the stain, our algorithm being sort of more or less our microscope that, don't get me wrong, we should update our microscopes, but we should think about why we want to update our microscopes. And sometimes we can more cheaply affect the data um, and actually sort of see what it's doing in ways that maybe we don't completely understand why the optics of the microscope have changed. Um, and then it can help us sort of learn things about our collections. And just a small note that for the Kohling paper, um, I have, the, I have all of the, there is a sort of working version of it online where you can first for any uh, mallet trained or gensim trained via the mallet method uh, topic model, you can sort of see how well your topics are correlated with any given sort of source sets you've had, along with a way for downsampling these texts so that they are hopefully more useful using LDA. And with that, I say, wanted to say thank you for listening. <laughs>